Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, it's my great pleasure as Director of the Centre for European Legal Studies to welcome you to this year's Mackenzie Stewart Lecture. Um, Lord Mackenzie Stewart was an alumnus of this university who became the first judge of the European Court of Justice and was its president. It was to honour his contribution and to celebrate the connections between this university and the institutions of the European Union and the Council of Europe that this lecture was founded. And we're particularly pleased that Judy Mackenzie Stewart is with us at this um, occasion to represent the family and the continuity of our connection with the family. The connections between this faculty and this university and the European institutions um, have continued with the current members of the European Court of Justice, uh, Alan Sharpston and Christopher Vaja. Um, and previous distinguished lecturers have included not only commissioners and members of the court, but also members of the council legal service. They've all shed light on the workings of the European institutions and the direction of European laws. We're particularly pleased with the support that is given to this lecture and to the center by Sherman and Sterling, and we're grateful for members of the firm for, for being with us on this occasion uh, and for all that they do for us. Commissioner Margrethe Vestager has been a member of the European Commission since 2014. She's a master's degree in economics and was then a leading civil servant, having been section, uh, head of section in the Ministry of Finance and head of the Secretariat to the Agency of Financial Management in Denmark. She was then a Minister of Education and rose quickly to be leader of the Social Liberal Party and Minister of the Economy. And her economic and political understanding made her a very appropriate person to take the competition portfolio within the Commission. Uh, in 2017, um, she received a doctorate honoris causa from one of our LERU partners, uh, the uh, Katholika Universität Löwen. Um, and the citation for that degree um, praised both her firm policy and competition and government support within the European Union, and also her special attention to the ethical dimension of the behavior of companies in government. She's been willing to confront difficult files which have landed in her in tray. And her title, Making Markets Work, engages with the challenges for all developed economies. Her focus will be on the challenges that face the EU in particular, um, and it will offer us a perspective in which to see the challenges that face our own, all our economies in the coming years. So with great pleasure, I invite Commissioner Vestager to give her lecture. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, not only will I offer you some thoughts on uh, data and the data revolution, but I'll also offer you a Brexit-free moment. <laughs> so consider it a spa. Uh, it's a great honor. It's a great honor to be here in Cambridge. It's a great honor to be asked to do the Mackenzie Stewart Lecture. Thank you very much. It is uh, 75 years ago, almost to the day, uh, that uh, digital technology scored its first, very first, big successes. It was at Bleachley Park, less than 50 miles from here, that the world's first programmable uh, digital uh, electronic computer known as Colossus cracked its first code, 5th of February 1944. Colossus was a huge advance to the machines uh, that came before it. But to crack a code, Colossus was dependent on the information that it was given. It was uh, dependent on intercepted radio messages. Those messages of those days, they were very faint. 
were very difficult to make out. And just one mistake in that radio messages, message uh, would make the whole text completely useless. So it was very fortunate that the team at Beachley uh, could rely on skilled radio operators because Colossus, like every computer the world has seen, seen ever since, could only reach its full potential if it has the right data. Everything has changed, but not that. And I think, taking into consideration how everything has changed, those programmers who made the first programming of that digital uh, miracle, well, they would be astonished if they saw what we have achieved today. But maybe the most remarkable thing is not only the revolution, but the enormous explosion of data, the amounts of data that we produce. Every time we shop online, every time we do an internet search, every time we throw uh, through the inner city with the phone in our pockets, well, they build up a record as to what we're doing. Every day, every hour, every second, every part of that second, you leave a trail of data behind you. And behind the scenes, modern factories, well, they products, they now constantly record data to be able to report back as to how the machines are functioning. How can they be run more efficiently? And for instance, the latest Airbus planes, they have now thousands and thousands of sensors on board to produce terabytes of data every day. And with all of that data at our fingertips, and with machine capacity to make use of it, well, of course, we can understand our world in a way that we never, ever were capable of doing before. Companies can not only come and repair a machine that is broken down, companies will come and tell you, your machine is about to break down, we better service it before it happens. What a good, a good thing here with the gas pipe would be my guess. <laughs> well, that of course, and of course it's very obvious that doctors will now know much better if any kind of medicine is, uh, is going to agree with us. Computers can learn to make judgments. Judgments that we thought were preserved only for us as humans. That we would forever be the best at doing. Like uh, recognizing faces. Or driving not just one car, but driving cars among cars. And pedestrians and people on bicycles. And all the very, very tricky decisions that will have to be taken at one time. So, Data gives us power, power to use our resources, power to find new solutions, power to shape our world, to use it for something that actually makes our world a better, healthier place to live. So, of course, it is thrilling. This is exciting. It has never happened before that we have this power at our fingertips. The thing is that we have some choices to make, quite hard choices, about who is going to use that power. Because this is still out in the open. Who is going to use that power? And for what purposes? When you, and at least when I, sit down, sit down to play a game of chess, we play the same game as a chess master would play it. But the chess master would see that board game completely different from what I see. I see a jumble of pieces and a grandmaster, he will just take it in in one glance. I would struggle just to see a few moves ahead and yet Magnus Carlsen, the highest ranking player in history, he can see as many as 20 moves ahead. And this is what data can provide for each and every one of us. This possibility of being able to see ahead, to be the grandmasters ourselves, 
to give us a new understanding that can be shared. Our world, what we're doing, how things are done, to make faster and better decisions. The thing is, of course, that if that is only for a few to be the grandmasters of seeing through our world, seeing the patterns, knowing what will happen, recognizing threat and trends and the like, well, what about the rest of us? How will we ever have a chance of keeping up? Fine if it's a game of chess. I live happily with the facts that Magnus will forever be so incredibly much better than I. <coughs> but what if, it, what if it's decisions about how our, de our democracy should work? Should that only be left for those who have the powers that data and digital arithmetic gives you? Or should it be for more people? That, of course, leaves a whole sort of sequence and speech about coincidence, because that's probably still part of the game. But that untold, how to make sure that this power is actually a power for society, to work for humans and not for itself. I think that it is a time to be concerned and talking about that concern and after having discussed that concern to take action. Because if we don't take action, it will have severe consequences for the very openness of our society, how it's going to work. And the thing is that also in what I like most, at least this is my day job, competition, it will have very, very important effects. The thing is, I think we need competition. We need competition to make sure that the market serves us in our role as consumers and customers, if we want the markets to serve citizens, we need competition. Otherwise, there's no guarantee that businesses will respect the fact that if we don't like the offer or the prices or the services, we go to someone else. So, we need competition. Well, the thing is that competition cannot work if just a few companies holds a very vital resource, you need to be able to compete and you don't share it with others. If it's just for the few and not for the many, also in a marketplace, that limits competition. And right now it looks as if data is becoming this very vital resource. The thing that opens or closes doors. And this is why it's very important that we don't allow data to be monopolized by a few. Of course, I accept the point that data is not necessarily easy to monopolize. Uh, there is uh, no limits to the number of companies who can use the same data at the same time. And some types of data, well, they're easily acquired or they are easily created at very low cost, or you can buy them uh, for a very small price. Uh, a few years ago, when Microsoft bought uh, LinkedIn, we investigated whether the LinkedIn data would uh, let Microsoft squeeze out rivals in the market. But it turned out that the kind of data that you would uh, get from the LinkedIn acquisition was data that you could easily acquire in other places, and even rivals didn't consider this data to be important for competition. So, everything was cleared. The thing is that it's not always the case. And uh, let me take you back to happier times when Denmark also ruled over the southern part of Sweden. <laughs> when our capital was actually situated in the middle of the kingdom and not at some strange corner. There's a reason for that locality as well. Everyone who's known uh, prisoners of geography would know that. Well, the thing was that between Denmark and now Sweden, <sighs> actually I have a very small sort of plot of land on the other side of Hallandsosen, but it's, it's a long stretch to try to buy it all back. <laughs> 
Well, anyway, there is a stretch of water which is called Uasun. Uh, today, probably you might have heard about it because of the bridge that crosses this belt uh, and from the Syria that carries the name of the bridge. Um, that's not what's supposed to scare you. Uh, what's supposed to scare you is actually the fact that um, that used to be the only way in and out of the Baltic Seas. No single country in those days controlled the Baltic region. The number of different kingdoms, no one was in full control of all of that water and all of that coastline. Not at all. But for centuries, Danish kings, they could decide who would enter. They, uh, they charged a fee. Quite, quite a fee, actually. <laughs> Usually they would take, I think, if it was barrels of wine that were being shipped, they would take one barrel out of 13, something like that. So they were well provided for. And they were well provided for uh, because they have the privileged position to, import, uh, to control the most important thing, access. <coughs> who can come, who can go. If you control access, well, then you don't have to control the rest of re the resource. And the internet offers us huge, huge amounts of choice. You can find everything. You can find products from millions of different of sellers. You can find news from every country in the world. But the thing is that they are funneled to us through very, very few access holders, gatekeepers. It's just a handful of companies. The search engine that finds us different offers of a product, the online marketplace where buyers meet sellers, the news aggregators that collects the news from all around the world. And like the Danish kings and the castles at Uersund, well, those platforms, they do very well from the fact that so much trade has to pass through their dominions. They have access to huge amounts of data about every part of the market. And obviously then for us, it becomes important to figure out, well, is that use of data used in the right way or is it used in a way that undermines competition? Amazon is a marketplace that links buyers and sellers. That, of course, is a good thing. Amazon is also a um, seller themselves directly. And very often, the products they sell, they are in direct competition with the very same sellers that they host. And that, of course, raises the obvious question, well, how is Amazon using the data it collects about other sellers through its platform, and whether that leads to unfair competition? We're not done yet. It's an early stage, so we haven't concluded yet. But we have gathered huge amounts of data in order to be able to have a qualified say on this. The thing is that what matters is that we're already at it, looking at what is actually happening when you're a gatekeeper, when you have the access code actually to this very large territory of the internet. One thing is that we use the rules we have already to do our best to enforce fair competition, to make sure that everyone has a fair chance of making it in the marketplace. Future may look different. Do we have sufficient <coughs> tools? Data becomes even more important by the day. The Internet of Things is, has established itself. It grows by the hour. The amount of data that is uh, harvested grows by the second. So do we have the sufficient tools? A few weeks ago in Brussels, uh, we held a conference with a number of the world leading uh, experts on tech and society. And one thing kept coming up <coughs> over and over again. And it also came in the more than 100 contributions that came in from the public. 
uh, that was concerns about, well, what will happen if just a few set of companies get control over the data you need in order to be able to compete? What will happen then? And we also get the same or the first sort of interesting ideas about, well, what will we actually do about it? Um, are my three special advisors, they were there, they sort of gathered what was of interest. And they are special in that respect also that one has an expertise in tech, one in economics, and one of competition law. And the thing is that they have been challenged not to give me three reports, but to give me one. And any one of you doing sort of uh, cross-faculty studies will know that this is a challenge. <laughs> this is the real challenge. Because if you want a paper to be written by a lawyer and an economist, and they agree on the content, and you have a deadline, <laughs> you know it's a tricky thing. Then you add on tech. So you know they're clever. So they're going to, um, to give recommendations uh, by the end of March in order not only for me, but for people interested to have a debate about, well, how are we going to solve this? Because now, in a very sort of classical way, I think we kind of agree on the problem or the risk that if data is monopolized, if gatekeepers not kept in check, then we have an issue. And then, of course, the next thing is to figure out, well, how to do. The thing is, of course, that there must be sort of a set of principles when we design new rules. Uh, and one of the principles must be that no solution will work until it's fair for everyone. Because uh, it will have to give companies access to data in order to be able to compete but it will also have to be fair to the companies who have invested in actually gathering data. Because we also want an incentive for people to be able to gather data, to create services that gets data, in order for this to happen. So we need to have both sides of this equation uh, represented. And last, and of course not least, but that I think goes without saying, no matter what we design, the rules will have to protect people's privacy. Because this is Europe. And we will not sort of design rules that will give up on something very fundamental, which is that we have now also digital citizens' rights, and we are to be protected. That may pose a challenge, yes, but it's not undoable. The thing is that no matter how much I like competition law, it will not solve the whole thing. We need to do more. Because uh, I think also people need to know that their data will not just fall into the hands of very few companies. They also need to know whoever uses their data, they would, will use it to serve our interests and not to undermine our privacy. Of course, competition law can give some help here as well. After all, the point of competition is to make sure that the market serves us as citizens to get us what we actually want. And if privacy is something that's important to us, well, then one would hope that competition would drive companies to make that part of their competitive edge. But if we want to make sure that privacy is really protected, well, the most important point is strong privacy rules firmly enforced. Because it's too easy just to sort of decentralize the responsibility to say, well, if consumers don't ask for privacy, they can't have it. They have sort of just said no. Because it's a very tricky thing. So a number of people here who, lead, who reads terms and conditions? <laughs> <laughs> yep, a sensible person and the crazy one up here. Another one, yes. It's a very tricky thing if you have a life. <laughs> the long, difficult to understand, keeps you from doing what you want to do now. 
And if you decline the cookies, well, then you may disable the, disable the site. It may not be possible to use it anymore. So it's too easy to say, well, consumers will have to get it sorted. <coughs> no, obviously, we need our regulators firmly to enforce the rights that we have to make sure that we can actually use them in a way that is accessible and simple. <coughs> but we do have a, play, a role to play, and it is important. But if we don't use the rules, it is increasingly difficult to enforce them. I think we need, I think we need new products. We need the market here to help. We can have our individual choices. We can have a very strong regulator that steps in with fines if rules are not of help. But we also need us as individuals to say that this is actually how we want things to happen. And we need help. So the marketplace could provide us with the necessary services actually to make it done. So that we get products that can guide us through the maze, that we get help actually to get what we want. And that could mean uh, keeping an eye on what's happening to our data, who is sharing it, what they are using it for, throughout the internet. It could mean helping us compare privacy of different services so that we can pick the one that we actually do prefer. It could even make sure that we as consumers get full value from our data. All of that service businesses could provide if we as consumers demand it. Even if we make sure that data is safe, even that, it won't solve all our challenges. Because when we hand over our data, we are telling not only a computer and the businesses or the government who runs those computers about ourselves as individuals. We are also helping them to understand how people in society at large are thinking and behaving and what patterns we follow as groups. And that, of course, builds an understanding as to how can decisions be taken about us or how can we be persuaded to do things that we may not otherwise not do. So we also need to come together as a society to make sure that we're not fueling harmful data use. We need to make sure, for, it, for instance, that uh, artificial intelligence doesn't entrench our human prejudice. I think one would, having worked even with simple code, that one would think, well, that's a question of logic. If, then, simple rules cannot be influenced. Well, the thing is that when you work with artificial intelligence that is fed on data, it is fed on data about the world as we know it. And there's a high risk that you then just get the prejudices from the world as we know it. There's absolutely no guarantee that unless you want it, that you get a neutral answer. Otherwise, you just get the same biased answer as you got before. So this is why we have been working with a group of experts actually to overcome uh, this problem to make ethical rules for how to develop artificial intelligence that doesn't undermine our fundamental values. Because it is a huge risk that if you just feed data, feed data in from the world as we know it, with all the bigotry and the racism and the class differences and the inequalities and what have we, well, this is also what you get. So you need to make active decisions. You need to have an ethical outlier, uh, outlay as to how you will do things. They will be done late March in their workings, and then we'll know more. So, this is decision-making time. Because over the last couple of years, data has shown some of its potential. How far we can go. And it has seemed as if we, as a society, was falling a little bit behind in understanding that 
what is it that is changing? How will we shape this change? I think we have been lacking behind. Probably with the Cambridge Analytica scandal, we got a huge sort of wake-up call. You know, one of those old-school clocks that doesn't have a snooze function. <laughs> it just keeps going, and no matter how annoying, you've got to wake up eventually, because there's no snooze. And I think this is where we are, starting to understand that we'll have to deal with these issues. We cannot just leave it. We've got to catch up. And I also think that <coughs> we get to understand that all those fun quizzes and what portrait do I look like? Well, those are not there for the fun of it. They're there for the data. They harvest just a little bit every time, every time you sign up and you think it's for fun and for free. You have paid. And I may not be a lawyer, but I am an economist. And you know what? There's no such thing as a free lunch. <laughs> not a free search, not a free fun game is not for free. Your pay is just in a different currency. It's with yourself and the data about it. So I think it is about time, if we can agree on these problems, that we figure out how to take action. And since it's, of course, about democracy, well, it's for democracy to take action. This will not make it easier to be a business. But doing business is about, not about just the ease of doing business. It's also about doing business in a society that also hosts you as a business. And companies who develop AI, well, they have to think very carefully from the very start as to how their products actually do become ethical. That they respond to the value base that has allowed them to be produced in the very first place. And businesses will have to be clearer about, with their users, exactly how we're going to use your data. Not just to, as they sometimes write in the terms and conditions I read, it is so nice, we just want to serve you better. To make sure that the advertising is for you. And not wasted and misdirected because it was more for someone who was two years younger or two years older or another gender. But for you. To make sure that we know what we're dealing with. Because this is how it should be that we know what we're dealing with. Because data can do great things for us. Truly, really great things for us. Allow us to plan traffic, to get us from A to B faster, safer, better. Allow us to solve diseases that we thought were unsolvable in order to cure the rarest disease that no one had ever heard of. Because all of a sudden there is a community which is global, of these 5, 10, 25 people who has this disease. All of that potential. All of that. And we need a lot of it in order to deal with climate change. Without the data to realize where we can save, how we can better produce, where we find the wind, where we find, etc., etc. Without the data, we cannot do it. That promise is not a promise that can allow us then not to think about the dark side of data. That promise should give us the energy actually to deal with the dark side of data, to allow data to be fully used, to be accessible, to make sure that it's used in a way that's really good for the individual, for the citizen, for the business, for our society. And not to be afraid as a society, to take control. Of course it's scary. Of course it's difficult. Of course coincidence will still play an enormous role. Of course we will not necessarily know everything in every step. But in the end, we must agree that the starting point is the very fundamental. That it's not for technology to decide our future. It is for us. 
because this is our democracy. Thank you.